Can everyone hear me? Can everyone hear me? I'm Hector Avalos from the Religious Studies Program, and I'm supposed to be on leave this semester, but I couldn't resist coming out for this lecture because we have Dr. Rami Arav, who is the co-director of the excavations at Bethsaida, where a lot of interesting things have been found, uh, including medical instruments. At Gate, he'll tell you all about that. Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Arav. He uh, has a PhD from New York University in Near Eastern Languages and Literature, as well as an MA and bachelor's degree from Tel Aviv University. Um, Dr. Arav has taught at a number of institutions in uh, the United States, uh, Europe, and in Israel, uh, as well as um, a couple of stints, I guess, one at the University of Munich in, in Germany, and also at Hebrew Union College in New York. I should say that our lecture is sponsored by the Jewish Studies uh, Committee, the Religious Studies Program, the committee on lectures funded by GSB and by Hillel. We are hoping that uh, students will be interested in Bethsaida, come and dig with us in the summer of 2002, which uh, by then we hope to have credit for uh, some kind of archaeology course. Uh, and Dr. Arav, of course, will be there, and I hope to be there as well to see what else we can uncover at this wonderful site. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Rami Arav of the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me here. I will uh, try to turn it on and see if it is uh, working. Is this OK? Yeah, I think they can hear you. There is a moon. OK, yeah, try it now. Yeah. Do you? Do you get to hear me? Is that okay? All right. So uh, I have a plenty of slides to show you, and uh, and uh, this is why I want to go right away into uh, slides. Oh, did I do something uh, with? No. I uh, want to go almost right away to slides and uh, tell you about the city of Bethsaida. So uh, the city of Bethsaida is one of the uh, uh, most frequently mentioned sites, cities in the, uh, in the New Testament. It is uh, the most frequently mentioned city in the New Testament after Jerusalem and Capernaum. And for maybe 2,000 years, the city was lost. Nobody knew where the place was until we uh, launched our excavation uh, 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 expedition in 1987, and we discovered where the city is located. And uh, we found it, and we excavated the site since then. <laughs> Uh, to our surprise, uh, nobody knew that uh, uh, before we excavated it was that below the city, which dates to the time of the New Testament, there is a prominent city that dates to the time of the Old Testament. That was something that came as a uh, big surprise to us, and uh, particularly by the uh, uh, size and the uh, uh, the, the size of the city of the Old Testament and the uh, finds that came out from, from uh, this city. Uh, we managed also to, during the excavation, uh, we managed to identify the city with, an old, with the Old Testament uh, period and to identify it with the capital of a kingdom that was uh, neighboring the kingdom of Israel at the northeast side of the kingdom of Israel. There was a small uh, kingdom by the name of Geshur, and Bethsaida uh, <coughs> was uh, a big capital of this city. This is also something that nobody knew before the excavation, um, before we, we uh, started to dig. So uh, we brought a lot of information to biblical studies in our dig, and we are uh, being for 14 years, but we are still at the very beginning of discovering the entire thing. <coughs> what I want to do with you now, I want to show you the slide. And uh, I want to show you both cities, <coughs> the Old, Te Old Testament city and the New Testament city. And uh, we will begin with, uh, with the uh, Old Testament city. <coughs> and first of all, with the location. 
of, uh, of the site. So here we have an area uh, satellite view of uh, the area. This is the Mediterranean. The Sea of Galilee is here. This is Galilee and this <coughs> is Golan. And our city of Bethsaida is located right in this spot right here. Um, this is the same uh, type of a picture, but you know, they, uh, when they convert uh, the, uh, the pictures and they make it uh, uh, the same picture <coughs> in, with altitude. So here is the Sea of Galilee. Here we are right in this place at the North Sea of Galilee. And, uh, sorry. <coughs> How do you like this one? Oh. How do you turn this one? All right, I think it is. Okay. So uh, we go now from a uh, satellite image to a helicopter image, and we see. Uh, the Sea of Galilee here at the horizon, and uh, uh, this is the site, the mound that we are, we, uh, we are digging. <coughs> the uh, reason that the city was not discovered and not found and not identified for so many years was that uh, the, the name of Bethsaida uh, uh, implies or translates to the house of the fishermen. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, scholars and visitors and pilgrims were looking for Bethsaida <coughs> near the seashore right here. Bethsaida is mentioned in reference to in the New Testament for uh, many things. Uh, three, at least three apostles came from Bethsaida. Uh, they were Peter, Andrew, and Philip. And uh, Bethsaida was a place that was visited frequently by Jesus and he uh, performed mighty works at Bethsaida, including healing of a blind man uh, and uh, the feeding of the multitude, perhaps the most important uh, miracle of, of Jesus, was performed at Bethsaida, according to Luke 9, uh, 11. And so you can imagine that Bethsaida was, had a, a tremendous history 2,000 years ago, and uh, it was uh, uh, unknown, the place was lost for 2,000 years. So people were looking for Bethsaida around the lake out here. And we are about two miles away from the lake. <coughs> and uh, nobody knew why uh, um, they can find it in uh, closer to the lake. Um, uh, when we realized that it is here <coughs> that far away, we conducted geological uh, surveys. And we discovered uh, that uh, the city can, oh, we discovered that something very interesting happened at the North Sea of Galilee. You know, the Sea of Galilee, which uh, uh, 25,000 years ago extended all the way to here. In the time of uh, the Iron Age, the Old Testament was here, and this is where Bethsaida is. Today, the lake is about that. Uh, the lake shrinks and retreats and, leave, and leaves the uh, uh, northern shore. The northern shores are always going back south and leaving the city you know, farther and farther away from um, the uh, sea, uh, from uh, the Sea of Galilee. So this is uh, the picture when I came to see the site in 1987. That's what I saw, a huge pile of stones on a large area. And uh, uh, that is what was seen and what was known from, uh, uh, from the city. <coughs> and nobody knew that this is going to be uh, beside uh, these piles of stone. So after digging the city for quite some time, we discovered uh, uh, that we uh, came up with this picture, which shows uh, what uh, the elements of the cities are that we excavated. <coughs> and the city extends on uh, a territory of about 20 acres. And here we see the northern walls of the, of the city. And these are the eastern walls of the city. And we get to the city <coughs> gate, which is right here. And when you enter the gate, from this area, you find yourself in the city on, of which this strip is only the eastern part of the city. And then you turn to the right and you go to a plaza here. And from the plaza, you enter a palace. And that all dates to the Old Testament period. From the New Testament, we have discovered a residential quarter uh, um, up on the north part of the city. 
and together with other frag uh, fragments of residents uh, uh, in this area, and a Roman temple situated right on the top of the ancient Old Testament uh, city gate. <coughs> so uh, this is uh, the picture that I saw. And uh, when, after uh, uh, excavating the site, what we have, and removing all the debris out from here, we discovered the city wall. And this is what was, in, what was hiding inside this pile of rocks, the city wall. Is, uh, is here, and we have uh, uh, restored uh, and uh, uh, reconstructed it in drawing, in a picture. And this is the, how the city looked like at the 10th century BC when the city was first founded. So this is a picture, it's not an imaginary picture, it is uh, uh, based on whatever we discovered here. Picture of the city, reconstructed of the, the picture of the city, dates from the 10th century BC. We realize <laughs> that in the 10th century BC, it played a major role in the history of this area. Uh, King David uh, came to Bethsaida in the 10th century BC, and he married the daughter of uh, the king, the local king, the king of the Geshurites, when he signed up a peace treaty with the Geshurites. And uh, he took her to, with him to Jerusalem, and they had a son together who became later on very well known, very famous, and his name was Absalom. So Absalom, from his mother's side, was from uh, this area. Mother, Absalom's mother came from uh, the city here. Uh, and uh, uh, Absalom, after ass assassinating his half-brother Amnon, fled to Bethsaida and stay there for three years until he was called back to Jerusalem. So this is also the place where Absalom stayed uh, for a while, <coughs> and uh, it was uh, uh, and he played a major role <coughs> in uh, the uh, uh, in the Old Testament period. Now we advance to the city gate. This is the city gate, and this is one of the most. Uh, uh, this is a major uh, uh, element in the city, the city gate. Uh, we, ex we discovered the city gate in 1996, and we excavated it since then. And it turned to be uh, one of the, la the largest, in fact, the largest city gate that was ever excavated that dates to the Old Testament period. It is larger than many gates that were excavated before. And it is not only the largest city gate that was ever found, this is also the best preserved city gate that was ever found in the entire excavations that uh, we do in the uh, Holy Land. <coughs> so here it is, and uh, this is a reconstruction of uh, the city gate uh, right uh, that you see right here on, on a plane. <coughs> so uh, the city gate has uh, 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 very interesting elements inside that I'm going to show you some of them. And uh, particularly interesting the, uh, are the elements which indicate uh, uh, religion. We have discovered that the city gate had a lot of high places and Celtic areas and places around and inside the city gate that were worship. Uh, uh, people would go there to worship and they would uh, uh, be a place of worship in the city. So in addition to the <coughs> temple of, that existed in the city uh, of which we have not discovered yet, the, uh, another place of worship was the city gate, and I'm going to show you uh, in a moment what we have done. So uh, here in red, you can see a couple of colors here. Whatever you see in red is the major city gate that we excavated in the, uh, in the last couple of years. The date of this city gate, the red one that you see here reconstructed, is the following. It was constructed in 850 BC, which means in the middle of the 9th century BC, and was destroyed uh, in uh, a fire in 732 BC. And we can point out to the candidate who did it, we think we suspect a certain Assyrian king by the name of Tiglath Pileser III who invaded to the north part of uh, the country of Israel 
and destroy this north uh, uh, part, the north uh, part of the country, and destroy Damascus at the same time. So this is Tiglat Pileser the third, and uh, the year is 732 BC. Uh, we could confirm it uh, uh, by you know, pottery uh, discoveries and also by uh, carbon-14 dating, and also by the way it was destroyed. It was destroyed in a military assault, and we had a lot of uh, remains uh, that pertain to this. Uh, we realized that the, uh, and I'm going to tell you a little uh, later on, we realized that the, uh, the red city gate here was not the very first city gate that was, ex was built, uh, there was another one uh, that lies below this red one, and this is the yellow city gate of which we have not discovered yet uh, the entire thing. We have only indication that we have there a city gate. What we need to do, we plan to do this coming summer, is to find a yellow city gate which would most probably somewhere <coughs> around or beneath the, this big one that you see in red which means beneath the one that you see here is another one uh, which dates from the 10th century city gate to the 9th uh, century city gate. So this is not the place where King David entered. He entered a, a, a lower gate. He entered even an <coughs> earlier gate uh, than that, which goes with suppo we supposed to, uh, supposed to be ar somewhere around uh, this area. <coughs> so. Uh, here is uh, an aerial shot showing you uh, the gate. You can see uh, the entrance right from here, and this is the entrance. And when you enter, there are two towers in both sides. Here are the two towers. This is the northern tower. North is on your right hand side. This is the northern tower. Here it is. This is the southern tower. It is just below or behind the tree. And then the four chambers set to the gate. Uh, one, two, three, and four, and uh, archaeologists tend to call this type of gate a four-chamber city gate because it has four chambers. Yet, just to show you how little imagination archaeologists sometimes <laughs> have. <coughs> so here we have our four chambers, and the one is here. The second is uh, still not excavated. That this picture is 1999 or uh, 98 when we have not excavated yet. <coughs> chamber number three and chamber number four is here. This is three and this is four. And they are uh, located in this area. The Roman temple is located right on top. So you, end, you would enter right from here, make a right turn uh, in order to enter the city. And that this right turn will is well, deliberately made so in, an, uh, in order to break the speed of chariots that's supposed to uh, assault the city to get to stop to make a right turn and uh, and then uh, here would be uh, this is the uh, a threshold here I'm going to show you that and then you enter the four chambers and then you go to the end. Uh, notice that we are going to look at a few of the uh, religious in, uh, 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 in, uh, implements and that were around uh, the uh, the city gate. So this is a, uh, a, a picture showing you uh, the courtyard here, the paved courtyard. This is a ninth century paved courtyard uh, of uh, the city gate. <coughs> and here is the entrance. It is 12 feet wide. And as you enter, right here, you notice right away that there are steles. There are upstanding stones that were used for worship on both sides. And here is a high place, another thing that we are going, I'm going to show you in details. And there is a bench right here. This is the bench. These are the two high places in both, uh, uh, high place here and the other one in two steles, upstanding stone that were used for worship, and here you enter. This is the threshold. This gentleman is now uh, uh, crossing the threshold on his way out of uh, the city. Now, this is a view uh, from inside the city outside. Notice this beautiful pavement and the uh, level of the of the preservation. We did not do any reconstruction here. This is the way we found it. And this is a 9th century BC <coughs> pavement. You can imagine how old it is and how, well, look at this, uh, how, how nice it is and how nice it is preserved. Just imagine our pavements, how they will look in 3,000 years from now. And <coughs> look at this. 
Uh, they're all basalt stones, and uh, it is, uh, as I said, 12 feet. And here we have the chambers uh, looking from inside to the outside. In the inside part of the city, there are uh, two more uh, upstanding stones, two more steles that were used for worship. What exactly was the worship there? What kind of things were brought in? What kind of uh, things the you know, worshippers would mumble when they would bring in? Uh, what, what we have no idea, but what we know is that in these places uh, we have these uh, um, uh, worshipping sites. <coughs> here is the threshold, and here you enter the city gate to chamber number four. Notice the nine feet state of preservation of the city gate, which is uh, with no, almost with no or with no precedence. And this is another view looking at uh, the uh, uh, city gate from uh, above, and you see uh, the, pa the passageway. Here we are looking at this passageway and the entrance to the four chambers. One, two, three, four. This is number four, three, two, and one is, uh, and one is here. And this is the outside and uh, a, a view on uh, the city gate. Another view from uh, inside to the outside, notice the threshold, which is again without precedent, such a threshold uh, was um, not found anywhere else. This is a view to chamber number one, um, and I'm going to go now to each and every uh, chambers. The chambers are, are enormous, they're very large in size, they are uh, uh, 30 feet uh, long and uh, they are uh, 10 feet wide, uh, more or less, and uh, you see how uh, they look like. <coughs> this is uh, chamber number three. In chamber number three, we discovered one ton of barley. You can see all these ashes behind. This is all barley. Uh, one ton of pure good barley, carbonated, of course, otherwise it would not survive 3,000 years. It was all carbonated, and we had like I mean, this ton of barley. Today, uh, we uh, display this barley in about five museums worldwide. They wanted to show the barley that we found here. <coughs> what did they do with so much barley that was found here? We have no idea. We could never interview anyone who was there. So we cannot find out what they do with the barley, but I can tell you what they can do, they could do with barley. They could make beer, and they could make, um, they can feed the animals. <coughs> so this is, uh, or maybe to eat it as kind of, of bread, so they, that is what they could have been doing with the barley. Uh, some, of, uh, some of us who were excavating this barley were betting that they were doing more beer <coughs> than anything else, and perhaps this is the reason they lost the city to the Assyrians. They had too much <laughs> beer. <laughs> or maybe there is the reason the Assyrians came over. <laughs> but uh, this is an extremely interesting discovery. On, in, in another chamber, we go now to chamber number four here. This chamber was packed with uh, pottery with shards of pottery, and we suspect again that the Assyrian soldiers, when they entered here in 732 uh, BC, and they saw all the jars and all the vessels that were here, they simply kicked them and broke them deliberately and spread them all over the room because they could not find one single jar, almost no one single jar intact. They simply broke everything away. And the reason they did it was because chamber number four was uh, the storage of the high place that was right next to it, and uh, that uh, contained all kind of religious objects that they didn't want to, uh, they wanted to simply to destroy everything. Here is another picture that shows you the destruction that was made by the Assyrian soldiers in 732, and uh, <clears throat> that was chamber number four. Now we go out to look at the high place, which was found right here on the north side of the wing. Here is the high place just when we excavated. This is the first day when we excavated. And we came on top of these stones here. <coughs> when I looked at these stones here, and I, uh, 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 I realized that these stones may be connected together, and perhaps they are, they were one stone, in uh, initially, so uh, what we did was uh, like taking all these one, two, three, four, five stones all together, 
taking them outside, turning them upside down, and we looked at what is on the other side, and the picture we got was this one here. <coughs> this is a decorated stele. Here is, you see, this is a stele, decorated stele. That is when we turn it upside down and we look at it, then we, today it is in a museum, and it is an exhibit in a museum, it looks like this. This is a stele that we discovered, and it represents uh, a deity, and the deity is here, of the moon god, and that is one of the deities that was worshipped at that side uh, in the Old Testament period, the moon god. The moon god was one of the most important gods of Mesopotamia and of uh, the northern sea of northern Syria area. And here we have him. Uh, he is indicated by this enormous crescent, which are his horns and crescent of the moon at the same time. The huge. Uh, uh, horns, and you can admit that in entire Iowa you don't have a bull with such enormous <coughs> uh, horns that are on the stele of Bethsaida. He is located on top of a of uh, a sign which says uh, stele in uh, Alluvian uh, language. <coughs> This is not the only stele that was found in this, uh, in this style. We know only three of them, other three, and this is another one which came from South and Turkey, and this is also the moon god, and, uh, 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 and uh, you have here again this enormous uh, stones. Ours is the only one which, which, is, which is datable and can go, and we can date it right to the year. And the others were found, and there's no date to the other three, four, that were known, that are known from the ancient world. Now, removing this uh, uh, decorated stele that was placed and broken right here, and we, we suspect that the Syrian soldiers did it deliberately, broke the stele, which means that they wanted to uh, state that their god is uh, pow more powerful than the local god here. And uh, under this, we had the entire high place. And this is the high place, three steps leading to a podium here. And on top of the podium, there was a basin. And inside the basin were two perforated mugs. And that is uh, what was found inside. We, uh, the discovery was so uh, uh, complete, so intact, that we didn't have anything there to do but just to clean the dirt. And the next thing we did was taking a student and trying to reconstruct a ritual of a Geshurite priest who would uh, function kind of a ritual in this. We didn't have anything else to do but to try now to uh, retrieve or reconstruct a uh, type of uh, ritual. And this is what we, uh, we do. This is a uh, uh, dramatic, my, one of my dramatic pictures showing how the high priest is going up the stairs and bringing his, the uh, offering to, <coughs> to uh, the divinity. And this is a view from uh, the divine. This is how the divine would look at it. <coughs> uh, point of view from God, uh, looking down at his worshiper, bringing uh, uh, whatever was inside this perforated mug and placing it in the basin. And uh, uh, this is a uh, reconstruction of the, uh, of the ritual. <coughs> so, uh, so complete is our discovery there that we could uh, go and, and just try to uh, um, speculate what the rituals could have been. And <laughs> here is another deity that was worshipped at Bethsaida. We have no idea who she was, but she has some Egyptian uh, uh, hairdress and Egyptian features, <coughs> and we have no idea who she was. Inside the, the gate here, uh, we uh, uh, retrieved, we restored, with painstaking endeavor, a jar <coughs> that you can see here, uh, a, uh, a jar with an inscription here that was in ancient uh, Hebrew letters. And the inscription uh, reads right here three letters, uh, which is uh, Leshem in, uh, in the name of or on behalf of. And here we have uh, a, uh, a, uh, a sign which represents the moon god. So this is on the name of or on behalf of the moon god <coughs> uh, inscription 
uh, on, a, on a jar. Few more jars and other objects that we discovered in the chamber right here are here on display and some other beautiful jugs and jars that were all brought to, uh, to chamber four and they were part <coughs> of the uh, worship. Uh, in, when you walk now inside here, uh, two, uh, two stellas, and this is the one that we discovered just last year, and this is the way we have discovered the stella. You see here it comes from out from the ground, it is all cracked and destroyed, and uh, um, most probably deliberately by uh, the Assyrian soldiers. <coughs> and uh, here it is. This is another one, and here is this one here. And the next thing we did after finding it on the floor was putting it together <coughs> and uh, gluing it and, uh, uh, and restoring it. And after it was restored, we even tried to restore the worship. <coughs> so here are some of our students worshiping this stone again. Another uh, uh, high place was found at the southern part of the gate. This is another high place right here, which has exactly the same features, of steps leading to a podium here. But this one was found with no icon and no uh, <coughs> no stele on top, and we suspect that that was made on the eve of the <coughs> conquest of the Assyrians, just before the Assyrians uh, conquered the city. The defenders of the city didn't know what to do. They tried to fortify the city. They put some more walls out here. They have fortified the towers. And in case that, uh, if that doesn't work and all the fortification won't work, they added another high place here that God and the local God will protect them. And of course, he didn't do that. <coughs> another high place we have discovered, yeah, just imagine all these high places in places of worship where it is just in one city gate. And the reason that we have so many and they were never discovered in other places before is because all the other city gates that were ever excavated were so fragmentary that all these little elements were all lost and gone and we have no uh, remains of this. But here we were lucky, simply lucky, to have a gate <coughs> that was destroyed so thoroughly uh, by or so uh, nicely by the Assyrian soldiers that it was that actually <coughs> it preserved of the gate. What happened was that the entire second and third floor collapsed on the first floor, and when they collapsed on the first floor, they actually buried the first floor. And what we did was excavating the first floor, removing all the debris, and getting whatever was there and left in the very last moment. This is also an interesting uh, thing that you can get to the very last moment, to one particular moment in history, and, uh, <coughs> and uh, dig this. Here at the back we have another high place. Here you, you see it here. And this high place was much larger than the others and I think that that was a sacrificial high place because it looks like a podium that goes, kind of a ramp that goes from the city plaza which would have been at the back of the gate to uh, the high place. Here we have discovered a horn altar right in this area and next to it a big pit which was about like uh, nine feet deep all filled up with bones and ashes, and that would indicate that uh, this high place was served for a very long time. And all the sacrifice, all the leftover of the sacrifice, they would place in the pit which was nearby. <coughs> Remains of the war were found almost everywhere, and we have uh, arrowheads, iron arrowheads that were shot <coughs> everywhere, here and there, and here you get another one and we had uh, another one coming here. They were found scattered all about the, uh, air, the area and uh, we can imagine that the war, the battle over the gate was very fierce. <coughs> we entered from uh, uh, the gate and we make a left turn and another left turn and we enter a storage house that was at the back of the gate and incorporated with the gate and this storage house was discovered also filled up with jars and everything was smashed and destroyed deliberately uh, and again by the Assyrian soldiers. Here we have one of the rooms uh, that was filled up with jars. None of them was complete and we 
picked up on that day like 17 buckets of sh or shards of pottery that made one time ago a uh, um, large amount of, uh, <coughs> of jars. Inside chamber number two, we had another surprise, and this is uh, the shape, in a shape of another stele that was incorporated in the, uh, in, uh, in, uh, the chamber here, and it indicates that it was not, uh, uh, of, uh, that was, it is a secondary use, <coughs> which means that uh, somebody uh, pulled it up from an earlier level and incorporated it in the gate of this uh, period. When you get this kind of thing in a dig, you realize right away that you have something earlier underneath, and that sends us all kind of indication that our ninth century gate is not the very first gate that was, ex was uh, built, constructed in the site. And what we did, uh, we could, uh, uh, in order to uh, verify this, we uh, conducted uh, a, a ground penetration radar <coughs> in this uh, uh, site all along the gate in order to find out uh, the, the gate. And this is what we are, this is the results of what you get. A ground penetration radar would indicate that here we have uh, the, uh, uh, an earlier gate. This is the ground penetration radar on the gate right in this area. And we had uh, indication that we have the gate. As soon as we had that, we start to dig in spots that like out here in order to find out if we have any indication of a gate here. And indeed we have here the uh, earlier gate. And this is the earlier gate which is buried under the gate here. This is uh, the corner right in this, in this spot. And you see how monumental this, uh, this uh, structure is. And that dates to the 10th century BC. Now excavation below the uh, storage also revealed a lower level and uh, lower uh, level of occupation. And we excavated whenever we could without destroying the gate. And in the, the back of the gate right here, we started to, uh, uh, we excavated too, a storage house that dates to the 10th century BC. They are all extremely important because they date to the time of David and they indicate that the entire biblical story that King David came to visit the town and the town was a capital city in his period could be uh, true. Uh, now, when you enter the city gate, you turn to the right, and, uh, uh, and you, if, you have a, if you had at that time a very special permit, you could get to see the king, and the king would reside in the palace, and this is where the palace <coughs> Uh, uh, was and this area is uh, this area is the area of the palace and this is the uh, ground plan of the palace that we have. It is a, a type of a palace that archaeologists and historians uh, call Bitchilani. <laughs> it is a lo elongated uh, type of a uh, palace here with an entrance right from here to the vestibule and then to the main hall. This is the throne room and this most probably the king here is the throne room. And that was where the throne was situated, was located right in this place. And most probably King David made his way that way and then he turned left and he saw the king here and he uh, uh, said to him, can I marry your daughter? And his daughter came out maybe from here or from here and she looked at him and she said, do I have to go with this man? <laughs> And the king who was sit seated here, he said, listen, if you're not going to marry David, you're not going to go into the Bible. And, uh, <laughs> and she said, for the Bible, I'll do it. And, <laughs> and she married him, and they had Absalom. So that was the palace where the whole story took place. And we are going to look at a couple of things that the king left for us to see in, in his palace, some of the jars that were there and in oil lamp. <laughs> that was there in the palace. And uh, one of the nice things that the king had in his position was a very small uh, uh, Egyptian idol that he had there uh, that was supposed to protect him from all kind of uh, injury. And this idol is uh, the Egyptian god, Patekos, that we know, beautiful rendering of an Egyptian <coughs> statue that he had. He had also some correspondence with uh, some uh, people uh, with uh, Hebrew names like this one here whose name was Ma Nikai or Mahai, <coughs> which was the pro 
runner of all the uh, all uh, the uh, uh, Michael. Now we are uh, leap we have we to the next period <laughs> and the next uh, period that we excavated was the upper layers and they are the city of uh, uh, Bethsaida which dates to the time of Jesus. So uh, this is what we have discovered. Uh, Bethsaida in, in, in the year 30 to the common era, this is like 700 years later or more, 760 years after it was destroyed in the year 30 to the common era uh, was rebuilt as a city and uh, was renamed as Julia after the, the name of the wife of the emperor Augustus and uh, the mother of uh, the reigning emperor at that time, Tiberius. Her name was Livia Julia, and this is her, is her statue. We did not find this yet, <clears throat> but uh, we know that it was, uh, she had a temple at the city. And this is a coin that dates to this period and tells us the story that the city was uh, uh, renamed <coughs> and uh, and uh, a, a temple was built there. Now, this city uh, had uh, a temple, a small modest Roman temple, but mainly what we have discovered was a residential quarter. And uh, now you have a chance to look at how fishermen like Peter and Andrew and Philip lived in a Bethsaida at the time when Jesus came to them and said, you are not going to be a fisherman of, man, of fish anymore, but I'm going to turn you into fishermen of men. So how did their homes look like? <clears throat> did they live in palaces? Did they live in, uh, in uh, um, uh, fancy homes? Or did they live in, this, uh, in, uh, in a different type of housing? So here we have a chance to look at this. This is a uh, remnants of a house that dates to this period, to the first century, and you can see right away from the construction that the house is rather a humble home. <coughs> and uh, and uh, here uh, we have some evidence for that. This is in a nice oil lamp that dates to the time, uh, to the first century that we discovered there. And this is an entrance, you see how uh, small, comparing with the gate and uh, the dates much earlier and is monumental. These homes are very humble and are situated just on top of the entire level here. There is no paved floor in the rooms. Uh, they simply had mats on it, but no paved floor. And then uh, we go uh, and, sh uh, and um, see the other parts of the homes, and I understand that my time is uh, limited to how much do we have, about 15 minutes? Okay. Uh, and uh, <coughs> and uh, this is how uh, their homes would look like if we would reconstruct them out of the, um, uh, for the remains. Uh, so this is a house of a fisherman. Uh, there could be any fisherman there. Uh, could be the house of Peter, or could be uh, any other house. The features of this house is a large courtyard. This is a courtyard, a large courtyard here. And the large courtyard was, had a, uh, uh, a dining room at the north. Um, uh, here uh, had a kitchen. In this side, the uh, um, uh, bedrooms were perhaps on the second floor, up on here. Uh, and this house had a uh, um, uh, wine cellar um, next to the kitchen, right in this area, which was a, another interesting feature. But this is a house that is, could be the house of Peter, or uh, could be just his neighbor. We have we don't know yet because we never found the calling card or the mailbox <coughs> uh, in the house. <coughs> we don't know even where to look for the mailbox. <coughs> but this is one of uh, the houses. <coughs> oh, one um, more thing. <coughs> uh, in the house, in this house, we found uh, a, uh, um, a wine cellar with wine jars here that you can see one of these wine jars here. And this is the wine jars just inside the wine cellar as they were left <coughs> uh, right uh, 
in, uh, in this place. We think that the wine, I mean, although we never tasted the wine, we suspect that the wine was not very good because we realized that the neighbors did not purchase any of this wine here and he prefers to buy his wine from other places and I'll show you right away where. And this is another house which we adopt the fisherman's house <coughs> because we had in this house, that was the very first house that we encountered and we had a lot of fishing implements here. You can see uh, a uh, anchor that we found, a uh, fish uh, net let weight that you can see here in the picture and here in drawing. And this is just another house, <coughs> the same type of a house that we've seen before with a kitchen right here and a dining hall here and uh, perhaps the uh, bedroom where either on second floor or the way uh, out uh, in this area. <coughs> uh, here is uh, uh, how, I'm sorry, this is how uh, the uh, uh, building looks today. Here it is. This is the, how the building looks today. Very poorly preserved comparing with the older uh, levels because there was nothing that covered it. That was just below the surface and it was uh, uh, preserved very, very poorly. Uh, we have indication that uh, these houses were uh, inhabited by Jews because uh, Jews at that time used to have very special vessels made of limestone that were used for purification purposes that uh, was something that only the Jews did at that time. And we are here we have some limestone vessels which are perhaps the only indication that the inhabitants of Bethsaida at the time of Jesus were Jewish. 